Hi folks, it's good to be with you. Love to everybody out there. We're doing the Biblical Doctrine of Hell and we're looking particularly at annihilationism, the view that uh, there is no eternal hell and we're going to look at the Bible and show that this idea of annihilationism is not biblical, that it's heretical. And so that's what we're going to look at. My website's jasonburnspreacher.com If you want to support me, you can go to my Patreon account which is at the top of the YouTube channel. So you can go on my website, jasonburnspreacher.com You can see me on Facebook, you can see me on Twitter and also I have a website called um, uh, Royal Blood Ministries website and there it gives you uh, information about what's happening and various things uh, that are happening in the next few weeks and, and months ahead. Before we start this study, I want to recommend a few books. Uh, John Piper, John Piper, Let the Nations uh, Be Glad by John Piper, published by IBP, is a really, really good book on mission. Uh, will really inspire you to do mission. A couple of other John Piper books. Um, the Supremacy of God in Preaching. If you're a preacher, get hold of this book uh, by IVP. You can get, I think, this book free and this book free on Desiring God Ministries. On Desiring God Ministries, you can get these books free, these Piper books. But this book on preaching is a really, really excellent book and very powerful. And then another book by John Piper is Brothers We Are Not Professionals and I think you can get this free of PDF on Desiring God Ministries and it's an excellent book to encourage you as a pastor to be biblical as a pastor so those are three John Piper books then I want to encourage you to get hold of this book by F.F. Bruce, it's an old book um, this is published by IVP uh, in a modern uh, publication, but it, it's an old book. Uh, and it's called The New Testament Documents. And it's really, really helpful to answer people like Bart Ehrman and modern scholars today who criticize the Bible on the canon. Uh, it's a really, really good uh, historical book, giving you the historical information of why we have the books in the New Testament. So I'd encourage you to get hold of that. The New Testament documents by F.F. F. Bruce, it will strengthen your faith. Then I want to recommend you this book. It's the Westminster Confession. And uh, it's published by the Free Presbyterian Publication. And in this book, you've got uh, the Westminster Confession, the Larger Catechism, the Shorter Catechism, the Psalm of Saving Knowledge, the National Covenant, the Solemn Leaving Covenant, Directory of Public Worship, the Form of Presbyterian worship, Church Government, the Directory of Family Worship. So this is the Westminster Confession of Faith. You can get it at um, the Free Presbyterian Publication. Get this copy, the hardback. It costs you about £15, maybe less or more depending if you can get it second hand. If you get it second hand, it, it cost me five pounds second hand. Richard Baxter says, as far as, I am, as far as I am able to judge the Christian world since the days of the apostles, have never a synod of more excellent divines than the Westminster Assembly. So this is a really sum of biblical uh, doctrine. Uh, you might not agree with everything in it, you might be uh, charismatic, you might be Baptist, you might be uh, Pentecostal, uh, Anglican, whatever, or Evangelical. But I guarantee that if you get hold of this book and you read it, it will really bless you. It will really strengthen your faith and it will give you a good overall view of Christian teaching doctrine. So I would encourage you to get hold of a copy and read it, digest it, meditate on it. It will really, really bless you. And then another book to get hold of and read this year is uh, Whatever Happened to the Ten Commandments by Ernest C. Resinger. Resinger. And uh, Whatever Happened to the Ten Commandments. And uh, it's published by The Banner of Truth. Get hold of that copy and read it. It will, it will blow your mind 
It really will show you how far the church has gone. Get hold of that book, Whatever Happened to the Ten Commandments by Ernest C. Resinger. Uh, Banner of Truth, really, really good book. Okay. So let's pray. So I'm, I'm, I'm putting four hours of study, five hours of study, well, no more, I'm more than that, six hours of study into 30, 40 minutes. So, so let's pray. Father, we just come before you today. And uh, Father, I ask that you would just bless this study. I pray that it would strengthen your people and it would help them. And I just pray you would comfort them and encourage them. And Father, just bless them in this study, Lord. And just may it be an encouragement and a help to them in their faith. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm using the King James Bible. So, first of all, I just want to talk about the history of the doctrine of hell and its denial. We're going to just look for the five minutes at the history of the church and how the church has seen hell and those who've rejected the doctrine of hell, who they are and the consequences of what it is to, to deny the biblical doctrine of hell. Al Muller said, no doctrine stands alone. Each doctrine is embodied in a system of theological conviction and expression. Take out the doctrine of hell and the entire shape of Christian theology is inevitably altered. I'll read that again. Al Muller, a great theologian, said, no doctrine stands alone. Each doctrine is embodied in a system of theological conviction and expression. Take out the doctrine of hell and the entire shape of Christian theology is inevitably altered. Uh, that's in a book and an article. And a lot of the historical information that I'm giving is from Al Muller's article in the book. Um, uh, in, in a book called uh, hell, Fire Under, hell Under Fire. In the book Hell Under Fire. Um, Al Mullen writes an article on the history of hell, and this is where I'm getting my information. So he says, no doctrine stands alone. Each doctrine is embodied in a system of theolo theological conviction and expression. Take out the doctrine of hell, and the entire shape of Christian theology is inevitably altered. So when you meet someone, or if you are tempted to reject the doctrine of hell, it's like a pack of cards. Once you take it, one card out, you know, like a pyramid of cards. Once you take one card out, the whole thing collapses. Okay? So be very, very careful. Be very careful tampering with the doctrine of hell. Because it, your whole theology will unravel and become liberal. Origen, an early church father, uh, denied the doctrine of hell and believed that everybody was going to be saved. And in 553, uh, the Fifth Ecumenical Council said, If anyone says or thinks that punishment of demons and of impious men is only temporary and will one day have an end and that destruction will take place of demons and of impious men let him be anathema so the early church father Origen believed in universal salvation that no one was going to hell and in 553 the fifth council ecumenical council condemned it Jonathan Edwards who is in like the 16th 17th century 18th century um, said, consider how dreadful it will be to suffer such an extremely uh, extremity forever. So, the early church, Origin, rejected the doctrine of hell and, uh, sorry, the, the, the early church father, Origin, rejected the doctrine of hell and the early church condemned that and said it was a heresy. And evangelicals have always, throughout history, held to the doctrine that Jonathan Edwards says that hell is a terrible thing. But we've seen in this day, in the modern age, such as Robert Schuller of the Crystal Cathedral in America, who said that, you know, we need to be positive, we need to get rid of the doctrine of hell. Now, in the 17th and 18th century, we had the Sassinians, uh, who, and also the Iranians, the English Iranians of the Platonists, who said that they didn't really believe in hell, 
but they let it be taught because they thought it would be good for social order, that it would keep social order. We have in the 18th century Thomas Hobbes, the, um, the philosopher who said that hell was, was not real um, and it was metaphorical and people would be annihilated. And we have the French philosopher Voltaire, who just rejected hell and Christianity uh, totally. But then in the Victoria, in the time of the, Vi the Victorians, in the 19th century, that is when the real crisis about hell came. We have William Gladstone, the great Prime Minister, who said hell is not needed. Uh, we had many Cambridge dons and many, many vicars who thought the doctrine of hell was illogical. We had writers like Lewis Carroll, um, uh, who said that uh, if hell was really, it would rather become an atheist. Um, uh, Lewis Carroll wrote uh, Alice and, and, and the, Through the Looking Glass. F.D. Morris, um, who was a, a minister uh, who uh, encouraged Christian social, the Christian social m movement, said eternal death was... Uh, eternal torment was a Hanabara doctrine. This is a minister in the church of the 19th century who inspired the Christian social movement, said that the eternal doctrine of hell was uh, abhorrent. W. Farrell, who was the chaplain to the Queen, Queen Victoria, said that the doctrine of hell, of eternal punishment, was blasphemy. So in the 19th century, we see the Cambridge scholars, we see writers, we see ministers denying the doctrine of hell. And there was four reasons. Oh, and then there was a bishop, uh, a very influential bishop in, in, in called Col, uh, Coleno, C O L E N O, Bishop of Cape Town, South Africa, who imbibed higher critical views. He was very influential in influencing people in the 19th century to deny the doctrine of hell. Then you have the American Henry Ward Beecher who said the doctrine of hell is spiritual barbarism. And as the church uh, became uh, uh, moving, uh, because the empires, like the British Empire, began to do mission and they met other religions, there was this feeling that um, we can't say everybody's going to hell because there are other religions. There was also a big strong emphasis in the Victorian period of family and idolizing and sentimentalism of the father. And so many, many theologians began to sentimentalize God and say that God was like a sentimental father. And these uh, ministers and writers and ideas permeated the church in the 19th century and weakened the doctrine of hell. In the 20th century, we had uh, a massive sea change on the doctrine of hell with Rudolf Bultmann, who said the cosmology of the New Testament is essentially mythical in character. So the academic theology of the 20th century, basically early 20th century, looked at the Bible as mythological, so the doctrine of hell was not emphasized. Karl Barth, uh, neo-orthodox, believed in universalism, Vatican II, uh, an influential doctrinal statement for the Catholic Church said that hell was that people would have, be saved and advocated universalism. Pope John Paul II um, ratified this in 1999 and said that there is no hell. Uh, hell is just your own personal condition. And you have uh, Catholic theologians like Karl Rayner, Hans von Balthasar, who also. Uh, believed uh, in universalism. So in the 20th century there was a massive collapse. The 19th century uh, the doctrine of hell was thrown out and, and it crumbled but then the final collapse came in the 20th century. People like Spurgeon uh, who were in the 19th century were few and far between who believed in the doctrine of hell. But then in the 20th century, coming up to uh, the mid 20th century and late 20th century, things even got worse because it even then began to infect the evangelicals. In the 1980s, evangelicals began to embrace universalism with John Wayner, who was a very great uh, scholar, uh, evangelical scholar, advocated 
uh, annihilationism, uh, universalism, uh, sorry, annihilationism, and then we had, uh, he believed that hell was sadism. Uh, you had John Stott, a major, major leader, towered over Wayneham, who advocated annihilationism. You have Anglicans, ministers, evangelical Anglican ministers, who en masse denied the doctrine of hell. Uh, this is uh, told by Peter Toon, who was an Anglican minister. He said in conservative circles, the, the, he said, a seeing that the, the Anglican minister was reluctant to publicly avow hell. So Peter Toon, who was a, a, an Anglican minister, saying that evangelical Anglican ministers in the 1980s did not want to say anything about hell publicly. Packer, J.I. Packer, notes really what all this amounts to in the 20th century was secular sentimentalism in the evangelical church when they began to advocate annihilationism and universalism and deny the doctrine of the the biblical doctrine of hell they were really secular sentimentalists and it went on the Anglicans in 1995 uh, made a declaration about universal salvation the evangelical alliance um, made statements about uh, de denying the doctrine of hell. There was American theologians like Clark Pinnock who said the doctrine of hell was a monstrous concept. Al Muller says the societies that gave birth to the decades of the mega church, the Holocaust, the abolition, the, the abortion explosion and the institutionalized terror now deemed that God answered the questions and uh, justified himself according to the dictates. So what he's saying is there was a mood in the 20th century and up, right up until our time where modern culture now turned around and the church turns around to God and says look we think you're a moral monster if you believe if you if, if, if this if you advocate hell so you've got to justify yourself God because we're kind of righteous and what Al Muller is saying look this is a society uh, the 20th century that where you had the Holocaust mega church where you had abortion who were they to judge God concerning the doctrine of hell Al Muller notes four fundamental things that brought uh, the church to reject and culture to reject the doctrine of hell. Four fundamental pillars that, that were in culture that got culture to reject the biblical doctrine of hell and embrace heresy. And those four things were the, the idea of God changed. There was a God of love but holy love that God is holy was put aside. So in the 19th and 20th century, it was emphasized God's love, but God as a holy God was denied. Number two, the changed view of justice. So the God, they changed the view of God, they changed the view of justice. Justice is, re is not retributive, but restorative. So you had John Stuart Mill, it talks about restorative justice. In other words, you don't punish the criminal, you rehabilitate the criminal. So the idea that you get punished for the crime that you commit was watered down. And that led to the watering down of hell. Third, the psychological worldview denying responsibility. Because uh, theologians and Academics emphasized people's psychological aspects of their failure, so they would say, you know, it wasn't you who, who sinned, it was your environment, it was your parents. What that did is deny people's responsibility for their actions. And that led to the watering down of the doctrine of hell. And then fourth, a change in the doctrine of salvation. Salvation no longer became safe from hell, but it became saved from your bad habits. 
So you've got bad habits and Jesus died just to save you from your bad habits. And so these fundamental four things, the changing of God, God's a God of love and not a holy God. Uh, the changing of justice, that justice is not about punishing but restoring. The change of the idea of responsibility. It wasn't you who did it, it was your, it was your family background or whatever. And then fourth, the change of salvation. Salvation is not redemption from the wrath of God, but salvation is just helping you out of your bad habits. So that's just a, a basic a historical overview of um, a basic historical overview of uh, why the church rejected the doctrine of hell. Now I just want to talk about the implications of that. Let's turn to Isaiah 55. Isaiah Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Verse 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing therein it is. The whole reason why the church and culture rejected the doctrine of hell in the 19th and 20th century was they didn't obey these words. Isaiah 55 verse 9 For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, men began to exalt reason. They began to reason and not accept this plain teaching of scripture. And it's very interesting that if you look at all the people that are mentioned concerning those who rejected the doctrine of hell. Many of them, perhaps 90%, 95% of the people that are mentioned, were all influenced by higher critical views about the Bible. Though, like most, John Stott wasn't, John Wayne wasn't. But Clark Pinnock, and then going right back to the uh, mid-20th uh, mid century, early 20th century, like with Karl Barth, Bultmann, then going right down into the 19th century with um, uh, Cambridge Dons and Vickers and uh, the, the guy I mentioned in Cape Town who influenced the Morris, uh, F.D. Morris, uh, Farrow and all these people. All of them were infected with higher critical views. So when people start to question the doctrine of hell, if you scratch between the surface, many of them will be infected by criticism of the Bible and philosophy. And those who are people who do believe the Bible, like uh, John Wayneham and, and Je Je uh, John Stott, what they've done is allowed reason to come over the Bible and to, and to shape the Bible in their own reason. They don't like the idea that people are going to perish forever. But it says here, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are the ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And it says there, verse 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper on the things therein I sent it. God's ways are not our ways, and his word is truth, and we stand on the word of God, my friends. Not on the philosophy of men. Uh, let's turn to Isaiah 40 verse 13. Isaiah 40 verse 13. And that is what happened in the 19th century and the 20th century. Men exalted their reason above the word of God. Men thought they were wiser than the word of God. But what happened? One theologian said this at the beginning of the 20th century. At the end of the 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th century, and this theologian said this, he said this, he said, if the church denies the doctrine of hell, then the 20th century will be a hell. And that's what happened. 
When the restraints of sin are taken off, men plunge into sin with dissipation. And that is what happened. We had the First World War, the Second World War, then we had the immoral 1960s and the, uh, the proliferation of abortion, the proliferation of homosexuality. Because men pushed away the doctrine of hell. You see, the church lost her power. The church lost her saltiness in the 20th century in the West. Isaiah 40, Isaiah chapter 40. So those who tamper with the doctrine of hell and think they are, are trying to be more moral and kind, just look at the fruit of the doctrine in the church over the last 200 years and you'll see that this is clearly a heresy and quite dangerous to reject the doctrine of hell. Isaiah 40 verse 13. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord, or being his counsellor, hath taught him. With whom took he counsel, and were instructed him, and taught him in the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and showed to him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are like a drop of a bucket, and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he take up the coast as very little thing. It was known the mind of the Lord. We have to humble ourselves. Before God. So let us just look at what the Lord Jesus taught about hell. Is the doctrine of hell that people will suffer eternal torment, is it biblical? Let us go to uh, Matthew 8 verse 12. We're going to look now at the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to look at... Now, if you want to listen to some sermons, listen to... Al Martin on the doctrine of hell. This is where I get my material from, okay? The history of the church on the doctrine of hell, I, I claim no uh, independent uh, research there. The research that I got for that is from Al Muller's article on that, okay? I have to give credit where credit's due. And my studies on the doctrine of hell from the Bible is from Al Martin's sermons on the doctrine of hell. Um, so give credit where credit is due. Matthew, Matt, so you can go and listen to Al Martin on Sermon Audio and they'll surely bless you powerfully if you go and listen to his ten sermons. I've listened to about five on the doctrine of hell. Let's go to Matthew 8.12. Matthew 8.12. But the son of the kingdom shall be cast, but the sons of the kingdom shall, shall be cast Unto out of darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You cannot get any clearer than that. You'll be cast out, and there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Out of darkness means you're out in the darkness. 22.13. So, uh, Matthew 22.13. Matthew 22.13. Matthew 22.13. Matthew uh, 22. 13. When they had heard these words, they. So is it uh, Matthew 22, verse 13? Then said the king to the servant, Bind him and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, cast into outer darkness. And Matthew 25, 30. Matthew 25, 30. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, you've got to understand biblical language in its cultural context. In the time of the Lord saying this, how would a Jew understand this? Well, the Jewish people saw fellowship in banquets. You know, they had these big banquets and the lights were on and there was love in the banquets and there was fellowship in the banquets. But it, and, and, and if you got to a banquet and it was shut, you weren't just shut in the darkness, you were cut off from the love and fellowship within that warm, lighted place of a banquet. So when he's saying, cast into outer darkness, he's saying, look, it's going to be terrible for you. You're going to be out of the presence of the fellowship 
and the love of God. Turn to uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 17. If we go to uh, 2 Peter, 2, 2 Peter, two Peter uh, chapter 2 verse 17. It says, These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with the tempest to whom? In the mist of darkness is received forever. The mist of darkness is reserved forever. So they're cast into the darkness. It, it's not on about annihilationism, you're dead. No, you're in the darkness in the sense of you're pushed out of the very presence of God. And you experience the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let us turn to Revelation 16.9, Revelation 16.9, Revelation 16.9, it says, And men was, was scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, who had power over the plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Verse 10, and the fifth angel poured out his bowl upon the throne of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed and their tongue for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. What that language is showing you is that the idea that these people who say, oh, uh, you know, uh, it's horrible. If, if, they've all, if people have just sinned a few years, they should be punished for a few years, not billions of years. But language like this in Revelation 16, 9 is showing you that, you know, even when terrible things happen, even when God strives with them, they reject God and, and God is angry with them. He's angry. Matthew 13, 24. Matthew 13, 24. In other words, the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. They are not righteous. But they are wicked, and they will refuse to repent. Matthew 13, 24. Another parable. Put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man who sowed good seed in the field. Uh, but while the man slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and went it his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou know so good seed in the field? From where then are the tares? He said unto them, An enemy had done this. And the servant said unto him, Wilt, uh, wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather together the first tares, and bind them in the bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Verse 36 Then Jesus said unto the multitude, Away, and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Explain unto us the parable of the tares of the field. So he explains... He explains what it means. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the, the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offended them who did iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. There's no annihilationism there or universalism. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom 
who he is to hear, let him hear. That You cannot get as plain as that. That is not annihilationism or universalism. Then if you turn to Matthew 25, 41, Matthew 25, 41, Then shall he say unto them, On the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed and everlasting fire, preferred for the devil and his angels. Everlasting fire. Now, the word hell, um, when the Lord uses it about 13 times, the word hell is Gehenna, maybe 12 times, um, is the word Gehenna. And it's a rubbish dump. And a lot of the universalists and annihilationists use this and say, you know, hell is just a rubbish dump. And the Lord uses this word a number of times. But it in no way indicates universalism or annihilationism. When the, word use, when the Lord uses the word hell and it means Gehenna, as in rubbish dump, the idea was the rubbish dump was the place where the sewer, the muck, the, 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 the total filth of the city went. Carcasses were thrown there and it, it was just the stench of death. And there was always a fire burning there. So when the Lord is using the word hell, and it's a rubbish dump, and there's a fire always burning there, it, it's a symbol of the utter devastation to turn away from the living God. That's what it means. So the annihilationists twist it. And the universalists twist that word. To give it a meaning. And an implication. That the Lord did not mean. When he used the word hell. And, he had this, and, and, the, and the Greek was Gehenna. He's saying this is a. You, you, this is a terrible place to go. Don't want to go there. It's just terrible. It's just fire. So let let's look at that. Twenty five. I think eighteen verse eight. Eighteen verse eight. So you've got to be careful of the dictionaries and the theologians and the scholars that you listen to and you read because they'll say Gehenna means such and such, and you'll take it on board and you'll be hoodwinked. Rather than looking at words, have context. Words have context. 18, and when you look at the context, they don't mean what you're trying to get them to mean. Uh, I think it's Matthew 18, 8. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut it off and cast it thou, it is better for thee to enter into life lame or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. Everlasting fire. No indication of annihilationism, no indication of universalism there. Matthew uh, 23, Matthew 23, verse 33. Matthew 23, verse 33. Repent, ye generation of vipers, that you may escape the damnation of hell. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogue and persecute them from city to city. So here, hell is punishment. They're rejecting God and he's punishing them for their sin. So let's look at uh, Matthew 12, 42. Matthew 12, 42. Matthew 12, 42. So I would encourage you, if you are a universalist or an annihilationist, or if you're a Christian and you're struggling with this view because of people saying that they don't believe in the doctrine of hell, or maybe you've got questions, 
I'll just take a pen and read the Gospel of Matthew and make notes when the Lord mentions hell. And just make notes and you'll be surprised that he speaks about it frequently. Matthew 13, 42. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. It, the idea is suffering. Matthew 13, 50. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. How can you read that language as annihilationism? I don't know. So let us just go to Acts chapter 20, verse 13. I just want to talk about this for a minute. So we've shown there are verses that clearly teach an eternal hell. Okay. And in order to get round these verses, you have to do a lot of gymnastics, theological and hermeneutical gymnastics to get out of these verses. So let's just uh, turn to Acts chapter 20 verse 30, just for a minute. Acts 20 verse 30. In. Right, Acts 20 verse 30 says, And to your own selves shall men arise speaking themselves things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch, and remember that for the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you... a. a an inheritance among all them. Uh, and verse 20, uh, Acts 20, verse 20, no, sorry, Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that afterwards my departed shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not separate, sparing the flock. If you're a pastor, if you're a preacher, if you're a servant of God, you, you are to teach the whole counsel of God. You're to teach sound doctrine. And you're to take heed to your doctrine. And you Christians uh, who love the Lord, you're to take heed to your doctrine. And you're not to be seduced by false teachers. And... What has happened today, and this is very, very important, is not only has the doctrine of hell been rejected in the world, but it's been rejected in the church worldwide. It's been rejected by the church generally. But then the Lord's people, evangelicals, what's happened is these annihilationists and universalists, they are many now, many Bible teachers, theologians, seminaries, professors, um, Publishers, they're, they're, they're into annihilationism, they're into universalism. And what they're trying to do now is to normalize this as the doctrine that's normal for Christians to hold. So the argument goes like this well, the annihilationist is saved and biblical, and, and the universalist is saved and biblical. So, you evangelicals that believe in the doctrine of hell, you've just got to accept it that we, we don't agree with you and we have a different view to scripture than you. We see it in a different way. Then you, you've got your view, we've got our view, but we're still all born again, we're all together and we're all united. And as John Bunyan says, Satan is busy getting people to not believe in hell. And so what this does is it's kind of like a nice piece of meat, steak. And you leave a piece of steak, fresh steak on a table and you don't put it in the fridge you don't protect it you don't put silver foil on it and put it in the freezer you just leave it out there and you get bacteria coming in and it starts to eat away and then next thing you know there are flies and maggots next thing you know the whole of the steak after a week would just be stinky mouldy and disgusting and it would be horrible 
And that is what is happening to the final remnant of the Lord. There is a remnant that has held on. But now these people who ministers and theologians and seminaries and publishers have come in now. And now they're trying to normalize annihilationism and universalism in the church. And they, and they cozy up to the and say we're evangelical, we're, we're the lost people. But we have a different view to you. But it's the maggots that have latched on to the stake. And they're not in a way, and eventually it will bring mold to the final remnant, and it will bring decay within the church, the final remnant of the church. We've seen it in the 20th century, what it did to the church generally, but now the Lord's people, the, the few remnant, the evangelicals, now the annihilationist and the universalist teachers, they've come in and they're saying, oh, we're on your radio show, the unbelievable radio show. We're, on, we're in these major evangelical uh, magazines now. We're accepted. We're, we're just evangelical. and We just have a different view than you. And what happens is the remnant will decay. The true people of God who believe in the doctrine of hell will become decayed. So you've got to remove that which is unholy and you have to contend for the faith you as a minister must preach the whole counsel of god you must preach on the doctrine of hell you as a theologian must write books on the doctrine of hell you as a theologian as a principal of your theological seminary must kick out the theologians sack them if they don't believe in the doctrine of hell doesn't matter how evident they are because your theological seminary will decay in the next 10 to 20 years. You will be no more. Your churches will decay if your ministers are preaching annihilationism and universalism. Kick them out. And those Christians in your church who believe in annihilationism, you need to take them aside and you need to rebuke them and challenge them. In other words, it cannot be accepted, it will not be accepted, annihilationism nor universalism, for it is a cancer and it will decay the church of God. And the fire will not burn in the church. There will be no holy fire, there will be no holy revival. There will be no movement of God's people. But the church will just decay. And then you'll have ministers say, we believe in homosexuality. We believe the Bible uh, is not the word of God. And this is already happening in the Church of England, the Church of Scotland, uh, major denominations. It's already there in full-blown apostasy. It's already here, my friends. But it's coming more and more, and it is already at the door of the evangelical church. And it must not be accepted. It cannot be accepted. And the Evangelical Alliance should be disciplined for its weak statement of the doctrine of hell. And any theological seminary and any denomination and any church must be disciplined for such is heresy. For we are not playing games here we are playing for eternity, my friends. The eternal destiny of men and women, and it requires men and women to be men and to be women and to stand like a rock, like a rock in the sinking sand of sentimentalism and the sinking sand of humanism and the sinking sand of relativism and postmodernism and the putrid effect that it's had upon the church. Cannot you be a man? Cannot you be a woman and make a stand for truth? Because, my friend, if you let it go, and you allow these ministers who believe in annihilationism to come to your seminary and your churches and your ministers fraternals, then in a few years' time, you will be lulled asleep. 
and you will not fear God and you will not fear sin and you will not fear or understand that Christ took the wrath that you deserve because it's a pack of cards and once one goes, it all goes. Once they start to chip away at hell, it'll chip away at the torment and it'll chip away at sin and people will be going to hell all on the ticket of annihilationism and all on the ticket of universalism, my friend. Make no mistake about it. I already proved that to you in the history of the 19th and 20th century church. You as a minister must teach the whole counsel of God. You have no right to play games with theology. Oh, I went to a, I went to a bookshop today to get a book and it was on Christology. It was only a little secondhand uh, book. And there was another book at the top and it was priced £40. I didn't get it, but it had been reduced to only a few pounds. A £40 academic book to about £2.50. I didn't get the book, but I got the book. I had a look at it. And there, and you ought to be ashamed, theologian. If you're a theologian in a theological seminary, you listen to me and you listen to me, God, because you ought to be ashamed about what I'm going to tell you. I got this book, Postcolonial Theology. Hmm. So I looked at the essays and uh, sexual identity in South Africa, uh, postcolonial studies of Jamaica. Uh, Derrida and the Bible. I tell you this, if John Bunyan would have read it, it had turned over in his grave. If Jonathan Edwards would have read it, it had turned over in his grave. What are you playing at? What are you playing at as a theologian? You think you're so wise and so clever, sat in your theological office with all your books, and you have this... Uh, credibility of uh, being a doctor of theology or oh, you reading your big academic works and your philosophical treatises and your work, you, you, you're writing your nice little papers on post-colonialism in Jamaica and the little uh, ditinets on feminism and, and uh, gay theory and uh, black liberation theology and what are you doing? You're fiddling while Rome burns, my friend. There is a fire coming upon men and women where they will be eternally damned. But because you are not submitting to the word of God, because you have not humbled yourself to the pure word of God, because you think you're so clever with your philosophical analysis and your sociological studies, you are blinded and cannot see the beauties and excellency of this word. And you cannot feed your soul. And you cannot feel the glories to come. And you have no idea of redemption. Being saved from the wrath to come. And you have no idea of what this book is all about. But you're so smug. And so self-pleased to yourself. That oh you are so sophisticated. And oh how that I'm not one of them fundamentalists. But the fundamentalist knows Jesus. And the fundamentalist ain't going to hell. But you'll go to hell with your postmodernism. And you'll choke on it in hell and you'll be sad. Forever and ever you'll be damned because of this postmodern philosophy that you've allowed in your Bible teaching. Shame on you as a theologian. Shame on you, theological seminaries. Shame on you. That men do not come out of your seminaries on fire for God. Shame on you. And don't get upset with me and don't say, well, we're never gonna we're never gonna ask him to my I'm never gonna ask him to give a lecture at this theological seminary. I don't care. What is men's thinking when men are going to hell? What is your opinion? Your opinion means diddly squat. Your opinion means nothing on the scheme of eternity. The word of God is above 
your opinion, a man and women are going to hell, a minister should be on fire, a minister should be burning with a love for the lost and be anxious to see the lost saved. And if you're a theologian or a pastor and you do not have this love and passion and fire in your bones, then my friend, you are lost. And your theology means nothing. It doesn't matter if it's published in a great theological magazine. It doesn't matter if you go and lecture at Oxford or Cambridge. There'll be fire burning. That fire will be a heap of postmodern theologians who thought they were clever but would not submit to the word of God. A minister should preach the whole counsel of God. Every bit of the word of God. You cannot play around with this book. You cannot bring in human reason and philosophy above this book. You must humble yourself and submit to it. For it is beautiful, it is the Word of God. And that's where we need to deal with this issue. The way, the way that liberalism and postmodern theology and these academics and these universities and, and uh, these clever pastors, when you've been into... Uh, um, pastors fraternals, whether the bishops and things like that. I've been in a few in the over the years, and these bishops and pastors, they've read a few philosophy books and sociology books, and they're all smarmy and think they're smart. And those who are evangelical read the Bible; they they look down on. But just getting a bit tired. At the end of the day, it's human reason. They're exalting human reason. It's just reason above God. It's reason that thinks it's clever than God. Who are we to judge God? Who are we to say? And so the argument goes, well, you know, God wouldn't do this. God won't send people to hell for eternal torment. He just wouldn't do it. It's, it's just obnoxious, yeah? it's obnoxious to our cultural sensitivities because we think that we are wiser than God and we have no idea how great God is and we have no idea of the enormity of the sin of rejecting him and the rebellion and if God wants to glorify himself and have a monument of heaven and a monument of hell to show his glory then so be it.